contents for uh, coding best practices. Uh, then I have uh, unit testing, but unit testing I will uh, cover in a separate session. And then I have the API version. So I'm working first the API analyzer. Uh, so why API analyzers? So we require uh, API analyzers. So we have found some issues uh, when writing the web API. So here I'm not going to tell you how to write web API. But uh, in web API, when we are writing the web API, uh, we are writing some messages. And uh, we have found that if the message is a failure, still we are getting the message status 200 OK. Uh, and, uh, if you're sharing your screen, the screen is not visible. If you are sharing, yes, one way. So when we are writing the web API, it's our responsibility to give the proper message. So when it is in development phase, it is okay. We can debug the code in testing phase. Also, we can tell to the tester. But that code, code goes on to the production and if you have the more than 150 web APIs or microservices. So then it is very difficult to find out the messages. And again, on where, on a production, uh, sometimes we are doing the hosting on uh, on premises, but mostly nowadays we are doing hosting on uh, cloud. Uh, in one project we did on AWS Lambda and then we found uh, when there is a success, then we are written status 200 OK. But uh, any failure or any other message, we are not giving the proper message. So Web API Analyzer, what it does, it helps in giving the proper message. Suppose here I am writing the uh, code here for get method. Here I am writing if uh, ID is less than or equal to zero, we are telling the bad request. Generally, what we does, the people don't write this code. Directly, people write the code. So when it is uh, okay, we, uh, okay then we will get the author 200. So we will get the status 200 OK. And when we are testing this code, when we are testing this code, we are not getting the proper messages. So to get the proper messages and detail of the each and every message or status 200, 401, bad request, internal server error, for this, we are using the Swagger. But Swagger do not have the corresponding proper fully metadata. And to get the aware of the fully metadata, we require some packages. And that packages are, and those packages are here. We have to include this package. And that package is the Web API. Go to the manage uh, in uh, enugate package, and uh, here you can browse Microsoft dot ASP.NET. See here, there is the Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.MVC.API analyzer. And uh, this package has the different versions. Latest is the 3.0. And uh, before 3.0, 2.20 and 2.26 is the stable uh, integrated package. What this package does, this package helps the Swagger to give the metadata. So when it gets the metadata, then it is uh, able to give the proper messages, not only for status 200 OK. If you have not included this package, you will not get the fully data. That's why I have included this package. And this package, I have here given the package. Here you can see the package. And here you can add the package also. 
so when we run the project generally when we run the project here when we run the project and pass data to the get method so we are getting the data so when we are testing this web api with the swagger so if you want to see this data we have already included this data in repository layer so here repository author repository is there and here see here we have created the list of author and we are passing this we are using this data and this repository layer method there is a get author method is there we are passing the id and this is written and this method is called in default controller and default controller we are calling the get author this is the author repository here the author repository declaration is here so when we are running this uh, method we are getting the method uh, getting the messages in swagger also i will show in swagger when i am opening that uh, postman and swagger by that time i will show the code so here generally what happens uh, we are writing only the uh, okay methods and uh, we are writing uh, giving the bad request methods so when we are including this package swagger then we are get, uh, we are able to return the bad request and other messages also this is the api analyzer i have installed the api analyzer i accepted there these are the warnings not errors the yellow ones now here in controller now if you go uh, here you will get the status code also status code 400 now coming to the uh, put methods here also we have to write uh, the bad request and ok uh, and a uh, status 200 ok methods and here when you want to detail uh, this method uh, messages inside the so api analyzer helps to give the uh, detail uh, execution of the data and what are the errors uh, we are getting when we pass the data in the postman as well as in swagger search
Now in Swagger, this is the API analyzer demo. Uh, when we add the methods uh, in any controllers, so we are getting the methods in uh, Swagger. I have only the get and put methods. And when we add many more controllers, then you will get uh, here the list of that web APIs. By default, now we have the only one. Now we are going to execute the method, this default method. So for execution of this method, here is the ID column. If we pass the zero and we say execute, so we are getting the method. So we are getting the response and that is the 404. Now, when we pass the data, a proper data and execute here, we will get the proper state code status 200. This is the response body and this is the response header. So the purpose of the web API analyzer is to give the proper information to get the correct data when we execute the method and here is the status code 200 success. It not only give for the 200, when you are uh, having the issue of the 400 or uh, anything wrong, suppose here I am passing here the ABC and I say the execute. So here, uh, here it is not allowing uh, the string characters because it is a ID required and integer type the path int of type 30. So we have to pass integer data. So we execute here. Now see here also we get not only status code 200, uh, 200. Now we are getting for the 404 also. In 404 it is showing the issue. The actual issue is we pass the data here and uh, here the message is title not found status code 400 and we are getting the here the response header also and request header also. So when we are passing the data and what are the expected result is according to the unit test cases and uh, your personal test cases, you have to write a code uh, in your web API. Now we are going to execute the methods in put method. In put method, by default, it is showing the example zero, first name is the string and last name is the string. Now response is nil. By default, it shows the 200 status code. Now what we are going to do here, when we are passing, we here, we are passing the data. API. Here the ID is to first name is Steve, last name is the Smith. Now we will try to update the record. So we will try out here. ID will be the two, and uh, here we'll pass the okay, here, and we'll pass the alien. Okay, and we will try to execute. So this is the request body we are passing to the put method. We are modifying the data. And when we are saying yes, we are getting the ID equals to two. First name will be the click and last name will be the yellow. So we are getting the proper responses and proper metadata. So to include by including the web API API analyzer. So this is the purpose of the code API analyzer. Now I am coming to the another one, the uh, that is the API versioning. This code API analyzer is very important when we are passing the uh, parameter and when we are getting the messages and when we are uh, logging those messages on the on-premises by using the serial log or on the cloud by using the application inside on Azure cloud or uh, we are using the on Google cloud, we are using the stack driver. So these messages should have the proper documentations. So to get the proper documentations, we have to write the code in a such a way that if it is null, then pass the return smart count. And if you hover the mouse here, you will get C creates a not found result. So status code status 404 not found. So by implementing the API analyzer, it helps to give the proper metadata. Now the bad request, it shows the creates and bad request. So status code 400 bad request. If it is uh, okay, then see here the okay object result 
and here we are getting the data and here in a catch request here you can here log the messages into the like a seri log or any other logging system or log for net or any cloud system you can log here or logging the messages now coming to another api version uh, solution now now uh, coming to the dotnet core api versioning why we require the api versioning uh see when we are doing the development uh we have some functionalities and some business functionalities and we are giving that business functionalities through the web api and we are exposing the get point to the customers or clients and they are pulling those web api and pulling those data displaying the data or updating the data but yeah the software industry when there is any business functionality added for the new users but those business functionalities do not require for the existing customers but we have to give to the new customers these business functionalities and uh, we have the existing customer they don't want to change or they are happy with the what are the business requirement and functionalities they are getting but how to manage that so we don't want to delete the old code also even we don't want to make the changes in their uh, or uh, running uh, web apis or services and uh, other people they want the whole business functionalities as well as the new top of functionalities on the api so for that we require the versioning so for api versioning we have to use some changes in a startup.cs file in startup.cs file we are having the startup file we are uh, providing the configuration i configuration builder and then we have the two methods one is the configure services and another is the configure method this configure method is to configure uh, the middleware just like in before the dotnet core there was the http modules and http handlers so you, we used to configure those http modules and http handlers in global.asx files now we are configuring here in, here in user authorization modules routing modules or endpoints here in configure module now here we can create a middleware for calculating the response time or we can create a custom middleware for error handling or we can create a middleware for error logging and we can configure those middle middlewares here in configure method so to configure the http request pipeline and whatever you have configured here that will be the part of the http request pipeline now coming to the configure service in configure services for versioning we are the basic purpose of configure services is to configure the services by using the controllers services dot add controllers and here in configure services you can configure your services now no need to create a container and no need to create a dependency resolver before dot net core we used to create a container the container purpose was to create the objects on demand and that objects we used to inject into the controller constructor or controller properties or controller methods by using the set get and we used to set that object injection into the controller construction so that is the dependency injection and creation of the object was created by the container and container was creating the object on demand as well as container we are maintaining the lifetime of the object so now in dotnet core no need to uh, create a container and no need to create a bridge between that uh, interface constructor and controller by mapping the i dependency resolver and to configure that dependency resolver in global.asx files now in dotnet core this is completely removed so dependency injection and creation of container is built in so we have to configure in configure services now here we are configuring the controllers now here we are doing the configuration for api versioning so we are telling to the configure services method so default api version for this web api will be the this one uh, assume default version when unspecified it was to true means you have not specified any version when you are calling the web api so that version will be the default version 1.0 so config report api version equals to 
so and here we are setting config.api version reader new reader equals to new header api version reader so equals to api version so the basic concept for the api versioning is in now in some projects still we have the some issues that we are we are not versioning the apis and when we are creating or adding the top up or new functionality in that particular web apis or adding the some methods we have some conflicts because we have not mentioned the default version so we cannot create a new version and how to map it with the old client and how to map with the new client it's a simple thing simple thing to versioning the web api so when you are versioning the web api and then you are calling in the controller writing the controllers and writing the methods then you can write to the methods like this so this is the default controller i am writing the api version 1.0 api version 2.0 so i am allowing the web api 2.0 as well as 1.0 both have the access to this uh, web api and here we are writing the we are writing the uh, methods this is the repository patterns this is the data for time being we are using and these are the methods now for a web api versioning what you require we have configured the versioning in the started dot class cs i annotated the controller and action with the appropriate attributes here we are telling to the controllers as well as we are telling to the uh, method also to map to the map to the versions so this method will map to the version 2.0 and as well as we have to install the versioning package so in this project we have installed microsoft asp.net core mvc versioning i will show here See Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.MVC.Versioning. Here are some issues uh, when configuring the packages. So before .NET Core 3.1, you can configure uh, the 2.0 uh, to 2.3.0 version because these are the stable packages. Here also I had faced issue. So I have configured here versioning 4 and preview. 8.19405 for .NET Core 3.1 latest version. So this packaging helps to create a versioning. So same way API, when we are publishing with version 1.0, 2.0, and we are enabling the versioning when we are accessing this uh, web APIs. So when we are accessing the web APIs, we can also check what is the version of this web API so before consuming it, so Swagger helps in consuming as well as uh, knowing the version of the web API. This is the default one. So in a swagger, we will uh, check.
I have some issues on my system for all of us, right? Post postman tool is running on my system. Just give me some time. Now here in header version. See here, uh, header version, we can check the what is the API version supports is the server name, API supported version and uh, powered by ASP.NET and uh, today's date is the 20th March. So here, my method support the 1.0 and 2.0 version. So here, I am not showing the data to you. That is not uh, more important. See here, data is also here and uh, raw data also you will get here. Test result. Here, header. So, here we are getting the version of the web API. So, supporting version of the uh, methods again we will check if there are any other method Here, uh, the another method is the get method. Uh, here, I have not done any versioning, so it will uh, it will show the simple here. Uh, there is no versioning uh, will uh, appear in the uh, header. So uh, this is for the API versioning. Uh, when we have to consume the uh, API versioning, and uh, another thing is uh, versioning. Uh, for consuming in a uh, API client, 
So when you are uh, consuming this WebAPIs in uh, React JS or Angular on front end side, uh, that time you need to pass the uh, version like V1, V2, uh, whatever the version you have created at the time of consuming the web API. Now coming to the the next topic is the coding uh, practices. So we have created the coding guidelines and uh, we have the best practices also. So we will go here, .NET Core best practices. Uh, so team, uh, what are the two topics I told you for the AP analyzer for writing the proper messages for uh, 400, 404 and status 200 OK with the proper data or uh, metadata by using the uh, AP analyzer and the second one was the versioning. The versioning is the most useful uh, to make a versioning. So you have to install the first the package microsoft.asp.net core dot versioning uh, package. And uh, second is you have to configure the versioning uh, in startup.cs by default when you are not mentioning any version. So that default version you mentioned, that default version will be called if you are not calling that versioning in the web API at the time of consuming, the default version will call. And the third thing is that uh, you have to uh, uh, decorate the attribute with the API version on the controller or on the method. So to map that method to the proper versioning. And the last thing is that you can check what are the versioning to this method is applied in the postman. So these are the two uh, things uh, uh, for the today's session. So for next 10 minutes, I will give to the, what are the .NET Core best practices, but I have to ask, uh, yes, Mahindra, uh, have you, any doubt on this API analyzer as well as API versioning? Mahendra, Saili, Jayashree, Adiba? Not currently, uh, Krishna Kumar. No. Yeah, yeah. So you have no, got sir. the purpose, purpose uh, why we are creating the API versioning to maintain the different version of your source code and uh, what are the uh, versions we have published to the client. Okay. So for the .NET Core best practices, this .NET Core best practices, uh, not only for .NET Core, there are for front-end Angular React uh, for uh, uh, coding guidelines by created by the architect we have in a Trello board. So that Trello board, I think you will not have access. So for .NET Core best practices. So generally here, we are considering the best practices when writing the web API and when writing the c code. There are for MVC, but learning met, we are not using currently the MVC project we have in maintenance. So mostly as a backend, we are using the .NET Core Web API. So in .NET Core Web API, there are the so many things are there. Uh, from a, a repository structure, a startup class, logging, controller, then data access layer, security, actions handling errors globally. This is the most critical parts and we are facing issues in the uh, in the projects. But in some projects like uh, Mahindra is uh, working, there are now these people are implementing the microservices. So these people are using the different patterns to lock the errors. Yes, Mahindra, I think you are using some patterns for uh, microservices, right? I mean, and, uh... Yeah, that will be implemented. Uh, we, we will be trying to implement one microservice in current uh, coming sprint. So to handle the all error messages, right? Uh, not for the error messages, but yeah. for a new future functionality, we will be trying to create a microservice. Microservice, yes. yes. And uh, you are the intercommunication between microservices? Uh, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So we are also expecting the one session from CSA project regarding the microservices. Ashwarya Ayer is going to the session on uh, container, uh, rancher and Kubernetes. Okay. So then after the errors, we are the action filters in ASP.NET Core. This is the content negotiation. Then always use the cache. Then avoid blocking calls. Now optimize data access. Perform operations in async, uh, async ways. 
then sttp pool use async await and ntt framework core query optimization so these are the things so in dotnet core we are creating the projects generally we have the such type of repository structure is there so generally uh, we have the esrc specs samples and this is the client ts files when we are consuming any uh, client side framework and we have here a signal r and version for giving the version into the uh, into the xml data here we have mentioned the travis.yml but generally in our organization we are using the um, aws cloud in some projects we are using the google cloud so we are using the cloud build.yml file the purpose of the yml file is the same or uh, uh, that is depends on the this is the circle ci and uh, travis for as yeah, a continuous integration instead of the gen filter in startup.file cs file already i uh, explained there are the two methods which are more important one is the configure service and another is the configure method so here configuring the containers for di which is adding the services to our application method in configure services and in configure method we are configuring the middleware or you can say the sttp module or built-in middleware like the api versioning authorizations these are the built-in middlewares we are configuring in configure service so these are the two parts we can also add the signal r related inside of the configure service so in startup.cs we have seen we add signal r we add radish so radish is nothing but for the caching and uh, by default in asp.net call we have caching enabled but that caching is a in memory caching so if any server restarts on the uh, .NET site, the whole cache data will restart. The cache will become the empty. So we are using the Redis cache for distributed caching. Then uh, here we are maintaining or telling to the configure services that whatever the services we are configuring, what will be its uh, type or you can say the single turn, scope and shared. Here one more are there, that is the uh, scope and here. So these things we are configuring here. here. So I user interface, here it will be here and here will be the service name. Now here in configure services, we can add the custom middleware this is the add custom customized signal r here you can create the middleware just like if you want to create a middleware custom error handling middleware error handling so you can create and you can register here and you can use throughout the application so for configuration of the middleware now question comes for the login so generally developers have two states in mind one is uh, people feel that the error handling and error logging are the same thing but actually it's a two different things error logging comes after the error handling error handling we are doing by two ways one is the try catch block and another way is the by creating the custom middleware or you can use the custom exception handler by implementing the i exception handler can implement the method on exception so these are the error handlings and when you found any error and that error comes into the try get cache block after try when it comes into the cache block then you can call the error logging so error logging why we require the error logging because we do not know on production or testing server or EOT server what happens when the users are doing the things are the users are doing the transactions what happens any transaction failures and in which methods are in which web API service or microservice. So we are logging the message with the method name and whatever the data we are passing. So we can take the log from the production server and we can give to the development team and we can create a ticket and we can tell them this is the area. This is the web API service or microservice. This is the method. And in this method, when we pass this data, 
are user have passed the data there is the error have occurred and this error we have locked into the logger and we are giving the log file to the development team to inspect the issues and to debug the issue and after they resolve the issue after testing that goes up into the testing cycle so the logging is more important so you can keep the existing logging system like a uh, stackify seri log and n log or you can create your custom seri logger so when we are using the logging system so to the constructor of the controller this is the controller home controller and we have this is the public constructor and to the constructor of the this constructor we are passing the logger interface and this i logger interface in dotnet core you will get by default they have the built in just you have to use that and we can log the messages and we can write the code by logging in the controllers here you can create your own uh, custom loggers by using the seri log or log format after logging the method so in logger you can extend your lo logging api by extending the microsoft extension dot logging or uh, accessing the logger factory via dependency injection and services by accessing the logger factory here logger factory also we are using i logger factory logger and passing the logger and here we can log the messages now coming to the controller in web api service or mvc the controller was there the difference is in mvc uh, the controller for the mvc controller and web api controller there was a two different framework now in dotnet core both frameworks have merged into one and here controller we are first thing we are always have to keep our controllers thin not thick so whatever the request comes to the controller just delegate that request to the other part here we are logging using the logger then we are using the repository any request comes to the controllers or controller method we are redirecting to the repository actions then repository will will access the PTO object as well as it will access the data access layer or if you have the uh, repository layer implementing the entity framework and below the entity framework there should be the database so we are keeping the controller as a lightweight controller only we are keeping the redirection of any action methods this in dotnet for this controller are nothing but the front controller pattern before dotnet code and a uh, mvc pages there was a web form was there that was the uh, page controller method now this is the front controller method this is based on the front controller design pattern any any action comes or any request comes any http request comes that request goes to the controller in controller it finds out the signature on the basis of the signature it calls the action result method that action result methods redirects or pulls the data and they gives the response but now we are creating the other layers and we are redirecting to the repository layer and repository layer talks to the entity framework entity framework talks to the database and we are returning so always try to keep your controller as thin as possible and on the basis of this controller you can write a unit test cases now as i told you this is the data access layer we are passing any request comes we are passing to the repository layer and repository logic should always be based on the interface to making it generic as well as the reusable now coming to the routing routing how is dramatically in web api we are using a uh, conventional based means uh, instead of configuration generally we are writing the routing logic on the controller itself and we are routing the web apis but if you are using the cloud or if you are using the microservices your routing logic will not be in the web api services or microservices we are using the gateway what is the gateway gateway is the 
फ्रंट गेट और फ्रंट डोर फॉर एनी क्लाइंट फॉर एनी यूजर्स आर रिक्वेस्टिंग अवर वेबसाइट दैट रिक्वेस्ट विल गोस फ्रॉम यूजर रिक्वेस्ट एपीआई टू द एपीआई गेटवे एंड एपीआई गेटवे विल मैप दैट यूजर रिक्वेस्ट दैट इज द डिस्क्रिट आउट बाउंड रिक्वेस्ट मैप टू द एंड दैट रिक्वेस्ट गोस टू द प्रॉपर एपीआई सर्विस और एपीआई कंट्रोलर और माइक्रो सर्विस मींस वी आर हाइडिंग द एक्चुअल सर्विसेज to the users those services are url we are giving him just that hits to the api gateway and api gateway internally maps internally map means tech lead are our developers have to do the mapping this is the incoming request then what will be is the outbound and outbound to request we are mapping with the api gateway so api gateway is the front door so in api gateway we are delegating the request to the actual services that will as another thing in api gateway we are doing uh, the authentication of the users and authorizations of the users so the same service or same request comes multiple times that users comes and goes that users uh, appears and disappears so we are doing the authentication with the help of the we write a one service and do the authentication that may be the token based authentication with identity server or with any other servers so these are the routing scenario changes with respect to your the deployment with the architecture of the project uh security talking on the security there are uh generally we have the authentication uh next is the xsrf policy uh then uh, jwt token So SSRF JWT token using the JWT token, yeah, uh, you can create a JWT token uh, by using the JWT JWT library in your .NET Core API project, or you can create a OAuth 2.0 library by using the uh, NuGet packages, and you can create the same token with the OAuth 2.0. So the JWT token, when you are creating, you have to pass some user credentials. then you get a token when you are using the client side framework like angular react or mvc they store that local to uh, token into the local storage and with the help of that local uh, token with every web api request configure that token in request header and pass to the web api with every request if you are using the client side uh, framework there are the uh, http request and there are http interceptors are there through the angular project or react project you pass that username and password and get a token for creating the token keep always a separate web api and for validating and once that token is validated or created you pass that token with subsequent request so security is the most critical part in web api services why because this web api are not part of the project like in web form we are passing the session that session goes from one place to another place this is doesn't happen in web api services or wcf services or micro services because this web api services sits above the http protocol and above the http protocol your local session or your token id or whatever you are you were passing the view state or view id or http hidden field uh, input hidden field that will not work. so you have to talk pass the token with the token you can pass the claims and identity also this is the user this user is a valid user this is the token and these are the roles permitted means this user can go for the withdrawal page can go on bank balance page also and this token can create a request also so depending on the users you pass the claims with that token then the cross site scripting is there so you you have to uh restrict the user uh, using the regular expression so hacker submit the malicious script as a input field for stealing the user's credentials or other important data so why this happen because we are not restricting on the restricting on the client side so how you will restrict the users the one is the regular expression then is the uh, uh, regular expression on the object model regular expression on attributes html coding html dot encode and url encoding 
So these are the cross-site scripting happens and we have to restrict this cross-site scripting when we are using the client-side framework and Java frameworks. Uh, when you are using the MVC, this uh, cross-site scriptings are managed very easily because in MVC frameworks, they have mentioned the anti forgery token and then cross-site scripting. Uh, that token passed from one page to another page also in MVC framework. So that framework have uh, inbuilt just uh, inbuilt packages just you have to use in your coding html coding url encoding now coming to the sql injection sql injection generally happens when we are passing the data in form of the query nowadays our development and architecture pattern are completely changed so we are not using that inline queries select star from or update the tables where the employee id equals to two or basket id equals to two this uh inline queries have completely changed so generally people used to pass the queries into that text bar and used to submit that queries files on the database and they used to change the data. But by using the SQL injection, we can prevent the SQL injection. So validate the inputs, use stored processor, use parameterized queues and use the entity framework or any other ORM to prevent the SQL injection. Now there is a cross-site request forgery is there. So for that, we are creating the validate anti forgery tokens for a cross-site request forgery. And uh, custom error handling is there for custom page error handling. Uh, we can use the exception filter attributes and uh, other attributes also. See here, we can create a exception filter attribute and here we can create or one filter attribute. So uh, in the next uh, unit testing session, there will be the unit testing session. So in this unit testing session, I will uh, complete uh, the remaining best practices. There are many more are there, number one. Uh, second, uh, I think you are using the caching. Mahindra, are you using the caching in the project in uh, CCA 428? Uh, uh, caching in the sense that Redis only, like where we are storing the data, right, for a uh, temporary purpose. Other than that, we are not using uh, anything else. Okay. Are you are you using the Redis caching? Yes, yes, Redis caching. Yeah, distribu the distributed caching. Yes. Yeah, distributed caching. So the next, I will give the how to go use the caching in memory as well as Redis caching. Then uh, I will give the session on the um, custom uh, error logger, serial log, and how to create a custom error log. Uh, next one is the uh, middleware, how to create a middleware and inject the middleware into the request response pipeline. And uh, so these are three to four with X unit testing. I will give the next session and uh, the remaining the best practices again, I will cover in the remaining next session. So uh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Uh, uh, thank you, KK. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. So I'm stopping the recording over here. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And again, uh, there are more sessions.